I made this video because I went to Poudre School District. I was in the same classrooms and the same hallways as the students that I talked to, and I was not treated this way. On June 23rd, the PSD board is scheduled to vote on renewing their school resource officer contract with Fort Collins Police Services. The contracts with the Fort Collins Police Department, the Tibnith Police Department, and the Larimer County Sheriff will cost the district over $1.4 million to put police officers in schools for one school year. I spoke with Fort Collins residents about this issue via webcam. Here's what they had to say. Being black in Fort Collins is stressful. My experience as a person of color here in Fort Collins has been, it's a very complex answer. Growing up in Fort what felt weird, felt scary, and then felt unfair. You know, I'm still just this dot in a white canvas. And so you feel that every, everywhere you go. In Fort Collins, when you hear it, it's like you're the one black person that you might see all day. When they see you, you're literally like an anomaly. Fort Collins is over 80% white, with the remaining population comprised of people of color. Residents of Fort Collins have taken to the streets to call attention to the injustice experienced in the community. Part of the effort and the anger behind Black Lives Matter is to recognize that people of color have been terrorized in this country. And terror is violence used to affect behavior. You don't speak out if you're fearful of being hurt or killed. Fort Collins is no different than the rest of the country in that sense. We dealt with the racism down south. In the south, they're very blatant about it. Here, it's a little more, uh, a little more slick with it. You know, it's done with a smile. The cultural biases that people have, they take with them into the job, whether you're teaching four or five-year-olds or where I am now teaching college. At every step in between, there is the bias that the instructor has. And law enforcement is not any different in this. People's perception of law enforcement depends a lot upon who you are. The result of seeing a individual murdered on television is traumatizing to anyone that has a sense of humanity. Your first thought isn't, this person is here to help me. Every time I hear sirens, I'm calling all of my sons just so I can hear their voice. You have the talk, as we say, with your children from an early age. And you have that talk with them so that they survive. I shouldn't have to be talking to my five and six year old brother about how to move so that the police don't kill him. They are afraid of the police. They know we don't want to see them because they kill black people. They're six years old. That is asking a lot of children. And I don't think it is fair. It's unfathomable to me, but unfortunately, it's a necessary reality. To be able to not have that conversation would be lovely. School is a microcosm of our larger society. What are we seeing in the larger society? We are seeing police brutality. We're seeing disproportionate use of force against people of color. What are we seeing in our schools? We are seeing the exact same thing. If the schools are saying they want equity for all children, my Black children cannot learn Knowing that there's an officer, black or white, walking around a building with a gun, and if anything happens, we go into the black kid. The data does not show us that children of color cause more problems. The data shows us that when there are issues, children of color are treated differently. When I first started getting juvenile clients, they were young people who had been here nearly their whole lives and had ended up in the juvenile justice system. And the way that they got there was nearly always through a school resource officer. The very first instance, my brother was taken away for two years and sent to multiple detention centers, it was an ROP, and it was literally over a skateboard. There were students at the school who said that my brother had stolen a skateboard. The SRO said, well, these kids said you stole a skateboard. We said he didn't steal it because there's no skateboard and there's no proof. The SRO comes to the house after school hours, asks the neighborhood kids, some of them who don't even go to that school, who did it, the kids pointed at my brother and he was gone. He was about 14 when this happened. He's been dealing with the repercussions of this. He might be getting ready to be done with it this year. He's 22 now all of that time, everything um, over a skateboard. The school to prison pipeline is very real. It starts out with a law enforcement referral for something that seems minimal. Um, and rather than deal with it in the school setting, it's sent to the juvenile justice system. Here we have a school resource officer that's a police officer. You got guns, you got mags, you got mace. 
If my son is dealing with something emotional or trauma, if he's in a room with a lot of white people that he is afraid of and that he feels inferior, he's going to withhold. He's not going to know how to act or he may lash out in a way that they don't understand. Now she has the authority as a police officer to either send him in front of the judge, send him to diversion, whatever it is. It's a legal system. People in uniform aren't trained to talk. They're there as a person of authority telling you, hey, if you keep doing this, we're going to have to take you in. Like, yo, that's not what we need. We're kids. Having people there be able to talk with them. Maybe they need an hour and a half to cry. The only time I got it was with janitors, like lunch ladies. Those are the people you connected with. And you know they don't get treated like they're supposed to because for them to vent to a kid, that's crazy. They should have a counselor for themselves as well. They shouldn't be telling us, hey, you know, the SRO is here, you know, stand up straight. <laughs> All these barriers are created because a figure of power is there. There is always a shortage of funds to modernize the schools. A million dollars could buy a lot of technology for students who are not fortunate enough to have the technology. Law enforcement in the schools is not helping that. Why do you have to invest into my children's life and into their future that way? $1.4 million? Like, are you serious? Give it to the teachers. Make them want to be there. Give them more resources so that they can be better educators. I could only imagine what it was like for someone that had been teaching for 10, 15 years, trying to make a difference, but there's no pay raise. There's no added benefits. As an adult, they don't get the help they need to help children. So what ends up happening, those good teachers move on to something else. And so then what do those people in power do? They try and take the easy route. Let me throw some money, get these guys in there. They'll do the rest, but they don't, they're not there to witness it. They're not there to talk to the kids. My sophomore year of high school, I was pulled into the office and the SRO ended up coming in. But the reason that the cop went in there was because the dean said he was fearful of me. I was at this point, two years student council, three sport athlete. I had never talked back to a teacher. I was a good eight inches and probably 60 pounds lighter than the dean who had called me in. But again, right, because of the last name Salinas, that fear stemmed with him and his first response was to go to a police officer. And because the dean asked me questions, the cop didn't have to Mirandize me. So my rights went right out the window and I ended up getting charged with what I said in that meeting. Ever since then, right, every time I walked past Sarge's office, you know, I was scared half to death, just like everybody else is. And whenever I walk past, it's always a hand from the front, the hand just hanging right on the side of the gun. And watching this whack past, holding onto his pistol and his sidearm. You see his Blue Lives Matter flag hanging up in the wall, and you know that he doesn't really care about you or any of your friends of color. And it's just that fear that I think a lot of kids have. I have a nine-year-old son. I know he has been involved already in three incidents in his schools where he's been called the N-word. I have had these conversations with him about his own fear. Someone that is in that uniform, whether they're guilty of these these atrocities or not, they still represent, they are a symbol of this thing that is killing someone that may be his own father, which is me. Having people in uniform, police uniform, SRO uniform, betray my trust, really changed my perspective of what those people I looked up to were supposed to be like. If I saw an officer in the front, I walked away. Just watching that made my heart beat. And I wasn't scared of of getting in trouble. I was afraid of what they were wearing, you know? The gun, the stick. I don't want to get shot. I don't want to get hit. No one had ever told me that's not going to happen. No one told me that police are supposed to protect me. Not until I graduated high school. That's how long it took for me to understand what the police were actually supposed to do. It does cause trauma. It does cause a sense of fear and uncertainty. They're going to think twice. Is that person going to protect me or are they going to hurt me? And my daughter, she was facing a lot of anti-Semitism remarks. So we met with the SRO to see if we could, you know, see what they thought about it. SRO asked my daughter to explain, you know, what's been going on. And my daughter explained, well, there's been a lot of anti-Semitism going on and kids drawing swastikas. And I'm the one who's getting talked to and these kids are not getting talked to what's going on. The SRO listened and then said, well, you know, I talked to these kids and they didn't really know what they were doing. They were just drawing the swastikas because that's what they do. They just did. That's what they do. And they didn't understand what it meant. And, and now let me ask you a question. 
and he directed it towards my daughter. Let me ask you about an incident that happened as you were walking to the school bus one day and you flipped off a kid. And my daughter was like, what? Yeah, these kids were the ones who have been harassing me and I got fed up basically. And the officer turned to her and said, do you know that I could charge you with a crime for that? And I was just floored personally. I didn't know what to do. It was totally terrible. We got out of the police station and the first thing I said to my daughter was, I am so sorry. My son gets to get traumatized going into school every day by just having that police presence. He gets blamed for everything because he's like one of the only minorities in school. So then he has to go down to the SROs and talk to her, play play basketball. You know, it's the first thing she said to him. I'm like, he's a figure skater. Why can't he be himself? You know, why did you assume that he, you know, he's, he looks black, so he must play basketball? But you see protests, the anger in the streets is a larger sense of the little anger that happens when an SRO interacts with a student of color where it doesn't need to be. Hooter School District, you know, signing the contract to have Fort Collins Police Department in the schools, I think it negatively affects the Black Lives Matter movement because it's it speaks volumes. Silence speaks volumes. Everything from the past literally plays into right now. I think by not acknowledging what's really happening, it costs the community a lot more and it puts everybody at risk. In my instance dealing with this, it gave us, you know, the exact opposite. But why would she want to go to an SRO now? Why do we have armed police who are trained to fight crime when you need people who can deal with homelessness, deal with mental illness, deal with bullying? These are this is not the skill set of what a highly trained, competent police officer is on the best of days. This is why we have social workers. This is why we have mental health professionals. The funds, you know, everything needs to be focused on teaching them how to act on emotion, you know, how to hug instead of punch. It is white people in this community that have to do the work, the introspective work. They have to remove this sort of fragility that they have about having these discussions. It's not a blame and point finger, but unless you understand your place in it, and maybe your silence and your unwillingness to accept these stories that are being told to you and these experiences that are real, you cannot have dialogue. You cannot. This is not white versus black, white versus minority. It's everybody versus oppression and racism. To my white parents that have children, I'm going to say just trust that we are parents together and we love our children the same. It doesn't matter what color we are. We love our children the same. And I want my children safe just like they do. To the community at large, thank you for marching in the streets and coming to these meetings. Uh, as you often hear them chant, this is what democracy looks like. To our black, indigenous, and communities of color, thank you for continuing to speak up and speak out. I understand that I will never understand. However, I stand with you and will continue to listen and to learn. When statements are like that, that have a promise, that's what people of color want to see. That's what parents want to see. But if nothing gets done after something like that is said, that's going to make it even worse than it was before because you lose that trust to someone who you were starting to trust again. My mom, you know, every year she's coming in and at telling him there's another kid with a Confederate flag flying through the parking lot. And it's the same response every time. It's the, I'm sorry, we'll figure it out. And you hear that so much that you're, just, you're tired of sorry and you're tired of we hear you and you're tired of... We empathize with you. If you support really educating students, having students safe, do something other than say it. We're not giving you fists. We're not giving you middle fingers. We're not giving you cuss words. We're giving you our hearts, our souls, and what we believe in, you know, our emotion. Like, that's what you have in your hand right now. Act now. You've got the platform. Show us that we can trust you and we can continue our growth here and then make the next platform better for the next generation. Make it safer for them so that they don't have to do this 10 years from now again because we couldn't do it. This doesn't need to happen to my children. They shouldn't have to be put in the situation I'm in. If the PSD board goes through with signing this contract, um, I'm going to be ashamed to say that, that Fort Collins, the community that I grew up in and love, is part of the problem. And the school district that I received my public education from is perpetuating that problem. They're seriously going to have to reconsider their motto of educate every child every day because signing that contract automatically makes that statement a lie. We, as white people, 
in this community cannot change things by just listening. We need to take action. The vote is on Tuesday, June 23rd. Contact the board, remind them that they are our elected officials, and tell them how you really feel. Thank you for watching. <laughs>